Good morning. Anybody a gardener out here? Well, yes. <laughs> Judy definitely has a green thumb. We know Nettie has a green thumb. Ah, Peter has a green thumb too. And Ashley, Beverly has a green thumb. Ashley, who's not here, has her seriously. She has a crazy garden in her yard. But part of being a gardener is looking at a plant and seeing something that's kind of dead and not producing anymore and taking the, the shears and going snip, right? You're cutting the dead part off for a good reason. Some of us need those big giant clippers. But <laughs> it might be hard for the plant to lose a part of itself, but the gardener has the bigger picture on it. He knows to do that. When we do that, it takes more nutrients to the plant, and it blooms better, produces more fruit. Last year, I had someone, our hedges on the side there got really unruly. It wasn't last year. It was a couple of years back. I'm sorry. And someone here said, hey, I'll take care of it, Pastor Chuck. And I figured they knew what they were doing. So I'm like, okay. I kind of like them high, you know, because it affords you some privacy. And uh, when I went out there, I came in here. I went out <laughs> a little while later, and my man took them down to about here. And I was like, what'd you do? And he goes, no, it's going to be cool. You watch when it come back. I said, yeah, but I like the height now. You know, so it's last week we talked about growth. And we talked about how it's God who brings the growth forth. But we play a part in that process. Um, this week we're going to talk about another aspect of our growth, which kind of relates to our faith too. It's called pruning. A working definition of pruning. And no one likes this, but it's to trim a tree, shrub, or bush by cutting away dead or overgrown branches or stems, especially to increase fruitfulness and growth. So like our journey, again, our faith journey, pruning isn't always easy, but it's necessary in order for healthy growth to occur, new growth. When I started in ministry, I thought, wow, you know, I was able to do Bible studies, and I'm teaching men's groups, and I'm leading prayer meetings, and then Pastor Rizzo threw me in a pulpit now and then. I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go, man. And he goes, no, you need a time of learning, and you need a time of schooling, you might be okay doing what you're doing, but you need to really learn how to be a pastor and take some counseling classes and this and that. So it's, and the same thing with David. David got anointed by Samuel to be king. He didn't become king till 20 years later, 20 and 20 hard years. You know, everything that could come at him came at him. The apostle Paul, he's on the road to Damascus. He gets knocked off his high horse. He's on his way to kill Christians. He gets knocked off his high horse, blinded by the light, but he sat in an incubation period with Ananias. It was three years before he met Barnabas. And Barnabas introduced him to the way. They were called the way before they were called Christians? Because they were afraid of him. He said, no, this guy's legit. So it, there was an incubation period. It, it starts out as a little piece of fruit, I think. And then God comes along and begins the pruning process and then goes, pluck, not yet, not yet. You're not ready yet. The next, the next couple of years or the next year, those hedges were nice and high the way they are now. There are times that God comes along and he kicks out all the props that you're leaning on and that are under him, just to, that are under you, just to start to get you some training and knowing that you got to go to him. When I got kicked out of the nest at my home church, I didn't want to leave there. I was comfortable there. You know, but it was like I, I started doing some things on the district and I always had my pastor I was in the inner three, you know, so it was always me, Charlie, Jan, and I always had them to fall back on for advice and, and talking to and praying through. And it was kind of like a bird getting kicked out of the nest. It's like, okay, you got to go out there and bear some fruit. And I was frustrated and I didn't understand it. Like, no, this is my home. My pastor said, Chuck, if you don't do what God called you, you're going to rot like a peach. And it was my time, you know, so you might have lost a job or you might have um, suffered a setback. But when God is involved in it, that setback is a setup for a comeback. But you don't give up. You never give up, and you stay the course. It's a tip that an increase is coming. That person that left you, their part of your story was over, and new growth is about to occur. So get ready for the new thing that God is going to bring your way. Right? And to frame our time today, we're going to be drawing from Jesus' words, John 15. This is a nice metaphor. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So you get cut either way, right? Whether you're not bearing or whether you're bearing. You are already clean because of the word I spoke to you. 
Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And then he says, apart from me, you could do nothing as far as kingdom work is involved, right? We got to trust that God has a green thumb. There's two important things right in the first verse. Jesus makes it clear he's the vine. He wants the listener to understand there's no life apart from me. Now, to abide, to remain, to continue, they all mean the same. To remain, to abide is a gift. It's the way you live in the presence of a loved one. Right? You abide, you stay connected with them even when they're separated. They're a part of you. They're never far from your heart, and, and the, thought of you brings, the thought of them brings you an aching peace. When you're in their presence... Words aren't necessary, right? You and I are called to abide and to dwell in Christ, to stay connected to the vine, and to shut off your phone before it rings. Pastor Chuck, you did it again. Sorry, silent, boom. And we're called to live as if it was impossible for circumstances or distance to separate us. The psalmist said, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Part of what it is to dwell in the vine, Jesus says, apart from me, you could do nothing. But part of what that is, is if you do not, the branch separated from the vine cannot bear fruit. We know that. All right? Secondly, the one who's responsible for the growth is God the Father. I mean... Who's more qualified to oversee our growth than the author of life, the author and the finisher of our faith? Right? God is a divine gardener, and he's an expert at facilitating our growth. Plus, we know he loves us. So the main thing to keep in mind as we're pruning is God is a divine gardener. We need to stay connected to the vine. And the gardener, the divine gardener, has a much bigger picture in mind than we do, and he's preparing us for eternity. In Romans 8, it says, we know that in all things... God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Again, he's not saying all things are good. All things are not good. Some things are just downright horrible, terrible. But he will bring good in it somehow, some way. Watch for it, right? And it, Pruning is kind of like a gentle art of elimination and cultivating. Sometimes less is more. If we go back to the working definition, to trim... A tree, bush, shrub, by cutting away dead or overgrown branches or stems to increase fruitfulness and growth. One of the main jobs of any gardener is to remove dead, fruitless, broken limbs from a plant. That always scared me. You know, when I was a new Christian, I heard that. I'm like, whoa, I don't want to be, you know. Important to understand, pruning is not punishment. However, the right knife in the wrong hands, right, will cut you in the wrong place at the wrong time. A gardener knows you have to trim back in season and certain times of the year, and he knows exactly where to cut. But if somebody else is doing that, you're going to get stuck in that ugly place. Believe me when I tell you, right? Um, your father, the gardener, controls where you get cut and when you get cut, and you don't get to choose that. But we know we have a loving father. You don't get to prick where he prunes you, but he will do it at the right time, in the right place. He knows when to take something away. He knows when to cut something back. It might be a friendship that's pulling you down. You know, if you're trying to get it and it just keeps sucking the life out of you. It might be a job that's completely toxic to you, right? Or a toxic relationship. You might cut that back. He'll prune those things away because he wants you to move forward. And to whom much is given, much is required. So, and trouble comes to every one of us. We know that, right? But we need to understand that God has a plan for your life. And it will occur that pruning, that setback, that cutback to release you from something to bring you into an abundance of life. You'll never become all you can be without that pruning, without the cutback. Neither can any plant, tree, or shrub. Often a plant is hindered by a dead portion, right, of its branches because it gets in the way. And sometimes a plant will waste energy and nutrients sending to a dead branch or a branch that's not producing any fruit. In our lives, we have similar areas that are blocking us. We have blocks. And, and God might need to close the door on something, but let him do it, right? And then open up a bigger door that no one can shut. It might be a discipline that we need to accept in our lives or need to start. I like the book Atomic Habits. It's a great book. 
Everything we do is out of habit. When you realize it, when you think about it, you might as well form some great habits, right? Um, and it could be an addiction that needs to be removed. And it doesn't have to be drugs or alcohol. It could be anything. A, a stronghold gets built up in your life, but he's come to break those strongholds. Recognize it. Trust him. You'll see new doors opening and starting to come your way. It might even be something good that you're doing. You know, it might be something good, but it's distracting you from something great, going from good to great. The gardener will prune those things back so we have a better opportunity to bear more fruit. When I was still at Maranatha, I was playing drums on the night shift and the night service, and then Charlie cut the night service. I had put flyers out advertising drum lessons uh, as a Christian drummer, and some guy saw it, and he called me up, and he was starting a new church in Jersey City, a youth church. Uh, well, it was a youth group, and he was starting a new plant. And he needed a drummer. And then he found out I was a, a minister too, so he got two for one. Um, and that was a good thing. So I'm doing that. I'm doing Maranatha in the morning. And he was doing a night service. So it was like, as soon as the Lord closed this door, he opened up this door. And then Butler started opening up. And I'm like, oh boy. Uh, and then I was preaching at the Chinese church once a month, which I love doing. All of these things were good things. But at some point in Jersey City, the lead guy decided, I'm going to cut the night thing and go to Sunday morning. And then he approached me, we still like you to stay on and teach groups. And I said, you know what? I'm going to look at this as the Lord closing the door. I need to concentrate on what I'm doing in Butler now. And then I told the Chinese church, you know, I love you guys. You know, and I still work with them every now and then, but I can't do it once a month anymore. I did it for a while. We're talking about pruning. And again, less can be more. God wanted to cut some things out that were good so I can come in and concentrate here. Now, the pruning in our lives isn't because he's angry with us. And it might seem that way because he takes something away, you know, and it seems like you're going backwards instead of forwards. But it's actually quite the opposite. You're, according to Hebrews, there's a race. And it's marked out for us, it results in a heavenly prize. And in order to run that race, what do you do? You get rid of everything that's weighing you down, whether there's sin, whatever it is, whatever it is, to reach the finish line. You don't want anything that will disqualify you from hitting the finish line. It says in Hebrews, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Again, it's not an easy or comfortable process, but in the end, the things that were removed, we find out weren't healthy for us. And that way, we can find something more from life that we could not have found without the pruning. The cutback season can be painful, and, and, but God has taken you through something to bear more fruit as we mature, right? And we're growing through the pruning. The tough time, again, it's important to remember. I always thought, and a lot of churches teach, you must have sin in your life, right? Because God took something away from you. He's not punishing you. It's part of the process. But we need to go through it to reach our potential that he has, that he has in store for us. Embrace it, right? You can embrace it and know it's part of the process and trust your Father, he won't cut something back without giving you something more in return. you got to trust him, but it's going to take some time, too. It doesn't happen overnight. Right? Now, any healthy connection to the vine will produce good fruit. That's why Jesus came. Yeah, we, we keep doing good things for other people. You know, we, we keep uh, serving him and serving others. We, just, we don't get bitter. We can get bitter and you get all angry. You go in the other. You kind of stay right where you are until that's over. All right, you have enough yet? Yeah, it's had enough. All right, now, come on, let's go. A Christian is someone whose strength solely comes from living in that connection to Jesus Christ. In Galatians 5, it speaks about nine fruits of the Spirit that should be a part of our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Anybody here need more love or want to be more loving? It's joy. Not joy and happy, two different things. Jesus, others, yourself. Joy is deep-seated and rooted. Peace. Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world does. Kindness. Hmm. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. We all, against such things there is no law. You know, I mean, think about all those fruits. These are areas that most every believer or every person wants incorporated in their lives. They want more of it. I hate when I lose control. I hate when I get angry at somebody. You know, it's, ah, there's the ideal and it's, there's a reality of who we are, but this is an ongoing process. And it's, it, again, it's like a full surrender. That word scared me too. 
I read a book by Andrew Murray called Absolute Surrender, amazing book. I read it back in the 90s, and I took that thing apart. And what I learned was when you do that absolute surrender, the B part is you ask God to keep that surrender because none of us are able. That helped me quite a bit. That took a lot of pressure off me. But we remain, remain in the vine through the storms, through the trials, through the hardships, remain connected to the vine, and remember, apart from me, you could do nothing. And when you're going through the storm and you're suffering, oof, it's hard to make any sense out of it sometimes. It's, you don't get an answer. You're like, why? You've got to watch the why questions. You're right in the middle of it. Sometimes you've got to wait till you get on the other side of it, right? And then maybe it starts to make some sense to you. The clouds are dissipating. You're starting to see, and you're like, oh. And then, again, you remember we walk by faith, not by sight. And obedience is proven best when you don't understand and you just take a walk of obedience. You're in the dark, but when you take a step of obedience, immediately there's light. God knows what's best for us, and his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. It might not make no sense to our intellect at all, and that could be tough, right? Come on, you're asking me to see where I don't see, and you're asking me to trust where I don't understand. That's, that's tough. He says, trust me and you will see, right? And you don't have to understand right now, but understand that I love you more than anything. And he's asking you to trust him in that cutback season, that, that pruning season, and recognize he's getting you ready for new growth. It won't happen overnight, like I said, but stay the course. Remain close to the vine. Remain in the vine, and you'll see a breakthrough coming in your life. Obedience is better than sacrifice, it says in the scriptures. We're not being punished just because we had a bad season. You know, and we think that again, like I said, but we're going through some suffering. It is not punishment from God. Pruning and punishment, very different things. Pruning is the fact, listen to me, that God sees something in you so valuable and so priceless, and he wants it to bloom. He wants to bring it forward. So more of it for you and more of it for everybody else around you. You impact everybody else with it. No gardener is going to prune a dead bush, right? He prunes you because you're fruitful, and he's intent on bringing more fruit from you. Those things I was doing in those other churches were fruitful, but he wanted more fruit. So he pruned them out. The pruning is meant to heal you. It's meant to heal you. It's not meant to hurt you, but to give you life in the full. Important, I didn't, I didn't decide to prune those things. I let the Lord prune them. I didn't leave those places because I caught an attitude or I was bitter at my pastor or whatever it was. And believe me, it happens all the time. But I stayed the course, right? And, you know, God's already in tomorrow. <laughs> he is. He's already there. So we kind of need to trust him with our todays and take it a day to clip. In Matthew, Jesus said, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks him for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil, and that means, that word evil means human. If you then who are humans, right, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? God knows what you need. Even when we come kicking and screaming because we don't like the way he's going about it, that's pruning. You probably did the same thing with your children when you were raising them. You kind of take some things. You can't let them do absolutely everything, right? It's not good for them. Spiritual growth doesn't happen and cannot happen by accident. That Christian life is a process that we enter into when the seed of the gospel enters into our heart. And we start opening up our hearts to the truth, to, to having Jesus Christ come into our hearts. And that's to grow in faith, right? And to grow in faith, it takes some intentionality. It takes some intentional effort. It takes some f determination. And that determination is what I'm telling you. You're going to bump with other Christians. You're, you know, you're always, there's always going to be, it's not going to be an easy, smooth ride. But determination to stay the course. And thank God for the unquenchable grace of God. That has to hit you. And thank, it's like wave after wave after wave coming into shore if you're looking at the waves on the beach. And he loves you just the way we are. Understand that. But he has so much more for you. He'll meet you right where you're at. You don't have to clean up before you. He'll clean. You, you, don't, <laughs> you don't take a bath before you take a shower. You know what I mean? He'll work it out. He'll work it out. You come as you are. But he has a lot more for you, and he wants you to walk into your destiny. Now, the musicians will start coming up. I want you to think about something. It's what are some areas of your life, specific areas, that could use some pruning to allow for healthy growth to occur? 
And what are some areas that need to be completely lopped off? You know what they are, right? For the sake of future growth. Are there areas in the past that you now recognize that God pruned away so healthy growth could happen, and now you look back on it and you go, yeah, that had to go. That had to go so I can get to where I am now. And again, I'm, I'm not where I used to be, but I'm, God's not done yet. You know, I'm a lot further than where I used to be. You trust him even when it doesn't make any sense. That's what faith is all about anyway, right? Trust that God knows what he's doing, that he has a love for you, even though the pruning process can be painful, and it will be fruitful in the hands of the divine gardener. Now, for the closing song, I don't want you guys to stand up. Um, I want you to kind of think about everything that I just said and, and kind of get some time to process it, and I want you to pray. You know, go between you and the Lord and pray for areas, for God to show you areas that need pruning. It's a dangerous prayer, but it's a wonderful prayer. And give, give, give God some space. Give the Holy Spirit some space. Try to take everything out of your mind right now. I'll lead you in prayer. They're going to do something nice and meditative. And um, let's see what the Holy Spirit does while we're doing this. Let's bow our hearts. Our deepest desire, Lord, is to grow in our relationship with you. So, Lord, please search our hearts, know our minds, remove those things that will cause us harm. Anything that's between us and you, Lord, that's blocking, you know, may your divine work in our lives cause us to be faithful followers of Jesus. And may our roots grow deep deep into your love, and give us a solid foundation for our lives. Stay in an atmosphere of prayer, please. You pray as you are. You don't try to copy a prayer or whatever. You just pray and be yourself. That's what he wants. And just pray like you're having a conversation with me right now. He knows the areas, and he wants to hear from you, and he wants to see that you're willing to let him work in there. It's not a punishment. It's healthy. It's so healthy new growth can happen, and healthy new growth can occur. Ask him into your heart. He knows your concerns. He knows your burdens. Cast your burdens upon me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul.